So we've been talking a lot about this transition from modernism to postmodernism, right? So much so that the language is actually probably starting to be a little bit stale. Y'all are probably getting sick of hearing those words. But it is extremely important to understand this paradigm shift. It is, and it is characterized as that by a lot of people. This, this is a really, really fundamental shift in the way that culture views the world. It's a very, very fundamental shift in the way that people observe and interact with the world around them. Okay, so all that being said, let's remember what we're talking about here, just so that we have uh, an idea of the language here, so really, really understand the definitions of these terms. Okay, so modernism, remember, is all about individualism, rationalism, and factualism. Okay, so it's first all, all about me. It's about, it's about uh, my own mind and my own self and developing myself. Then it's also about rationalism, which leads into factualism, which says that if I use the right systems, and if I have all of the right data, and if I'm smart enough and educated enough, I can arrive at objective truth. Okay? Objective truth meaning truth, meaning that there are things that I can understand about the world around me. Postmodernism is a bit of a shift away from that. Okay? Postmodernism meaning after modernism, right? So postmodernism, whereas Modernism emphasizes the individual, postmodernism emphasizes the community, okay? And this is a good thing, I, and, and many of us, you know, all, all of us value community, but postmodernism, the postmodern mind does so even more. Uh, we're more interested in the views of other cultures, we're more interested in how the world interacts with, its, with itself. Uh, if we look at the state of technology, for example, in the world around us today, we live in a more connected world than we ever have before. You know, uh, the, the distance from the United States to Japan is a lot less than it used to be, right? Whereas modernism emphasizes rationalism and factualism, postmodernism emphasizes relativism. So relative truth. So your truth and my truth may differ. And that's because postmodernism emphasizes experiences. So my truth is developed uh, over my life due to the experiences that I have. It's not due to this, you know, rational thought process where I arrive at objective truth, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so last time we talked about how that transition from modernism to postmodernism, another way of saying it is this transition from the 20th century to the 21st century, we talked about how that transition is going to affect how we do church. We discussed how the gospel is always communicated through the lens of culture. Now let me be clear about what I mean by that. We don't want to say that uh, we need to change the truths of the gospel for every new culture, right? We don't want to change the words of the Bible. What, what we want to do is we want to figure out how to communicate the truths that never change in the gospel to a new generation. This is what the church has always done, okay? The church has always been the avenue through which the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached and interpreted from the gospels. Right? Because if we just read the Gospels and just only focus on the Word, we're worshiping the Bible, right? Do we worship a book or do we worship a man? Right? We worship Jesus Christ. And we're, and we're called to interpret the Scripture and communicate it to every new generation while still being very, very careful to hold tightly to the truths of the Gospel. Because the Gospel doesn't need to be watered down. The Gospel doesn't need to be changed. The Gospel doesn't need to be... Um, the fundamentals of the gospel doesn't need to be changed for a new generation, but the way that we communicate it and the way that we impart the gospel to the new generation usually does. It usually shifts as we go through some of these major uh, changes in human history. So uh, last time I spoke to you guys, um, we talked about this in very, very broad terms. We talked about all about what this modernism to postmodernism thing is all about. Remember, we talked about uh, Paul speaking to the Athenians at the Areopagus, where he, he quotes their own philosophers at him, and he says, uh, "You know, we're we're both from the same we're both from the same flesh. Everyone was born from the same flesh. We're all born from the same God. Uh, God created all of us. We're all brothers and sisters, right?" But then he also challenges the Athenians by saying, "And judgment is coming." God has given you proof of who he is, so you need to repent and believe in him, right? It was a good, great example of how we can speak to people who may see things very, very differently than us. So we spoke about it in very, very broad terms, talked about a whole lot of complex things, but we landed on something pretty simple, right? We need older Christians, we need Christians who are mature in their faith to mentor younger Christians. And that doesn't just mean younger in age, that just means young Christians, new Christians. We need people who are mature in their faith to mentor those of us who are new to things. Because postmoderns, we're so excited about making all these new connections and making all these new friends and spreading the gospel to all these new people, oftentimes we chuck ourselves right into the mouth of a hungry lion. 
We need you guys, mature Christians, people who understand their faith and understand their world, to pull us back a little bit, to teach us and instruct us. There's another pretty simple word for this that we use very often. It's called discipling. All right, and I would like to suggest that here in the 21st century, the church could do a better job of discipling people. So here at Crosspoint, we're still navigating how best to do this. But we are convinced, along with many other churches and along with many other Christian thinkers, that intergenerational mentoring is going to be an important component of discipleship in the 21st century. Dad was just talking about this. You see, in the, 21st, in the 20th century, rather, in modernism, it was rather effective to impose a decision on somebody about whether or not they're going to believe in Jesus Christ. I'm sure a lot of you guys have a story about this, 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 this moment. It might have been in an altar call. It might have been at a youth rally when you were a kid. It might have been uh, in, in, a, in uh, con- a Christian convention that you attended where they give you the, they give you the decision, right? They say, they say, you need to, be- to believe in Jesus Christ or not. You need to make the decision about whether or not you're going to believe in Christ. Sometimes we use language like you need to ask Jesus into your heart. And that's all good stuff. And I believe that, that often, uh, I, I know some of you probably have those stories of this, this, this magnificent moment, this moment of redemption where your life was going in one way and then all of a sudden you changed and you started going in a different direction. But I would like to suggest that there are many people, in fact most people, who do not have that story. Instead, their, their walk of faith their, their, their conversion process it took a bit longer. It's a little bit more of a process where they, they begin to walk with Christians, they begin to go to church, and they begin to learn more and more things about the gospel until eventually they begin to understand some of these things and grow and grow and learn and learn until finally they are Christians. Conversion becomes another part of the discipleship process. And I think this is going to become more and more common in the 21st century. So, First, I want to look at one of the commandments of Jesus, one of the most important ones in Scripture. So we, we're, we're talking about this shift, remember, from the 20th century to the 21st century. In the 20th century, it was very, very common to impose this decision on a person. But let's look at what Jesus actually commands us to do here in Matthew 28, verse 16. Can we get that up on the slide? Thank you. Okay, so this I'm reading from the NIV here. Um, You can follow along with me. I'm sure this is going to look familiar to a lot of you guys. Again, this is Matthew 28, 16. It's what we often call the Great Commission. All right, so uh, Matthew writes that the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's a pretty heavy command, right? That's kind of scary. That's like a really super big deal. The ends of the earth, every nation. We're supposed to disciple every nation. But then Jesus says in his Jesus way, And surely I am with you until the very end of the age. He says, yes, that's a big deal. Yes, that's a hard commandment. But don't worry, I'm with you every step of the way. Right? Now notice, okay? He doesn't say, ask them to let me into their heart. And he doesn't say, convince them to make a decision to believe in me. He says what? Go and make disciples. Teaching them to obey everything, everything I have commanded you. Okay, so that's different, right? In the 20th century, that decision often led to discipleship. It didn't always, but it often did. Today, but, but, but that discipleship is really the point, right? The discipleship, becoming, becoming a devoted follower of Jesus Christ is really the point of all of this. So church, I think we are in a wonderful position to create a whole bunch of new disciples, just like those who came before us were able to do in this previous cultural paradigm. Just like those in the 20th century were able to make millions of disciples of Jesus Christ under that cultural paradigm, here in the 21st century, we're going to be able to do the same thing. But what it's going to take is it's going to take the church adapting to and, and changing a little bit with the 21st century. 
in order to communicate the gospel effectively. And we don't have to worry about it because what does Jesus say? He says, I'm with you until the very end of the age. I'm with you through every cultural shift. I'm with you through every change in thought. I'm with you through every era of humanity. Okay, so one of, this, one of the major components of this shift in cultural paradigms, this shift that I like to say is from decisions to disciples. This is what a lot of Christian scholarship is talking about these days. Um, and many, you'll read it in a whole lot of books. If you want some of them, I can give them to you. But it's, the, it's, it's this shift from modernism to postmodernism. And in that shift, there's a shift from decision-making to disciple-making. We're focusing less on getting people to make that decision to believe in Jesus Christ and more on discipling, this discipleship process. So what this means is that our process of evangelism is going to look a little bit different, right? The way in which we convince people to believe in Jesus is going to look a little bit different. Please understand, though, that I'm not saying that previous uh, methods of evangelism are bad or ineffective. I'm merely suggesting that we need to shift them a little bit to adapt to this changing culture. So I'm not saying the 20th century is bad. I'm not saying 20th century methods are bad. I'm just saying that, it's, that it's, we're, we're experiencing a shift in American culture and the church needs to follow along with it. Okay? Because I know many of you have stories like this, these stories of radical salvation, uh, this moment of salvation where you were going in one direction and you, you went into another one. So I don't want to discount those because I do believe those events happen. So um, what I am suggesting is that we're already seeing a new sort of prospective Christians walking into our churches. Okay? What I mean by prospective Christians are just people who are not Christians who are sort of exploring the faith, who are exploring spirituality. They may be looking at a whole lot of different, different religions, but the people who are coming into our church look a lot different than the people who are coming into churches in the 20th century. They just do. There's a whole lot of scholarship happening that's discussing these things. Um, one is a fantastic book written uh, by uh, Ed Stetzer and David Putnam called um, Breaking the Missional Code. If it's, it's a really easy read, really accessible read. If you guys want to read it and learn more about what we're talking about here, uh, you can do that. Um, can we get those bullet points up on the, up on the thing? The thing, whatever, whatever it's called. Oh. So remember, when we say prospective Christian, we're talking about an unsaved person who is interested in Christianity, okay? This might be somebody who has never even been to church in their life, okay? Let's, let's look at some, uh, so David Putnam and Ed Stetzer, they went all around the country and studied all kinds of churches trying to figure out which churches, first of all, are uh, effectively communicating the gospel uh, to the 20th century, 21st century mind. Because what, what, what did we learn la last, last time we spoke? We learned that as American that, how am I going to say this? That the church, that church growth is not keeping up with the growth of the American population, right? So as, American, as the American population grows, the church population isn't growing as quickly, okay? So we're losing market share in the, in the market of ideas, right? We're, we're, we're losing our grip on American culture. So what these guys wanted to find out is which churches are, are, are defying that trend, which, which churches are still able to make new disciples in this 21st century. And then not only that, but what do those churches look like? What are some characteristics of those churches, and what are some characteristics of the people who are being saved in these churches? Okay, And here's what they found. Number one, in today's context, the average person finds the church through the personal invitation of a friend or coworker who is either a young Christian or a prospective Christian. Once again, that means a non-Christian who is interested in Christianity. Here's the point. They're not coming to us anymore. Okay? Christianity is no longer the default. When somebody has something stirring in them, this, this spiritual need that they want to go figure out, we're no longer the first stop. That's, what the 20, that, that, that's one of these, the consequences of this big shift in cultural paradigms. So we must go to them. We must treat North America like the missions field that it is. Okay? And notice this. So it's either a young Christian or a prospective Christian that's inviting these people. So the average person comes to church through the personal invitation of a friend or a coworker who is either a young Christian, brand new to all this stuff, or isn't a Christian at all. Right? So you have this non-Christian who's trying to figure out, you know, what his spiritual life looks like, what his next step is, and he's saying, I don't know, I don't know if I believe in all this stuff, but these guys are kind of cool. They're saying some nice, you know, stuff that makes sense. Why don't you come along? That should challenge us. 
That should challenge mature Christians. The most people, the average person who comes into the church from, from, from the wider world isn't being invited by us. They're being invited by young Christians or non-Christians. That was really interesting to me. Number two, those who attend church who are formerly disconnected from Christ and the church often attend, get this, for several years before publicly confessing their faith. Okay? So when a brand new person comes in, which is becoming more and more common, by the way, in the 21st century, more and more people have no background in Christianity. They have no knowledge of the Bible. This stuff is completely foreign to them. Those people who attend the church, they are not saved in a moment. Sometimes they attend for several years before publicly confessing their faith. Now, number three, put a pin in that. During this time, they often participate in many aspects of church life. Those who go public with their faith have often been discipled and grounded in the faith long before going public. Get this part. Conversion in this context is a part of the discipleship process. Okay? Number four. Let's do this last point. And this is the important part. Those who are formally disconnected from the church who find Christ and assimilate to the church in this way seldom fall away. Change seems to be lasting. So when a new person enters into the church and they are discipled in this way, this way that can take years, this way that they are often serving in the church, you know, they might be working as an usher, might be working in the children's department, they're, they're actively serving in the church and actively interacting with the body of Christ, it might still take them years to publicly confess their faith. But that doesn't matter. Because if that happens, if it happens in this way, the change seems to be lasting. Do you see the shift? We're going from a decision, an altar call. Again, none of those things are bad. But we're going from a decision to disciple making. Okay? So, imagine over the next, you know, 10, 20 years, we're having dozens of people coming into the halls of Crosspoint. They're all brand new to this stuff, and they may need years of mentoring, of teaching, of shepherding, of serving before they become ready to publicly confess their faith in Jesus Christ. Can one guy handle all that? Can one senior pastor handle all that? Dozens of people working with them for years before they publicly confess their faith? One guy or one group of leaders? Of course not. Jesus could only handle 12 of them, and one of them still betrayed him. And he's Jesus. I don't think Jim's Jesus. So why do we expect so much from our senior pastors? This is why we need mentors. Because in the 21st century, this is what evangelism looks like. This is what discipleship looks like. Conversion becomes a part of the discipleship process, not a moment. That's why we need mentors. That's why we need every mature Christian coming together and being prepared to speak into the lives of a prospective Christian. Uh, luckily, we have some awesome examples of mentoring in Scripture, right? We have, we have very good uh, stories that we can look at to understand what this stuff looks like. Uh, one, one of my favorite examples is the Apostle Paul and uh, Timothy, Okay, so he, t- he, took, he took charge over this young man named Timothy. Timothy was an interesting guy. He had a Greek father and a Jewish Christian mother. He was taught the law and the prophets. This would have been the Old Testament from a very, very young age. And Paul instructed Timothy about the gospel. Okay, Paul, Paul taught Timothy everything he knew. They were very, very close friends. It wasn't just a teacher and student relationship. It was a, it was a friendship. And Paul trusted Timothy so much that he eventually placed him as head over the church in Ephesus, Ephesus, which Paul had planted. So they had a really, really strong trust for each other to the point that that Paul, rather, would often call Timothy his son uh, in, in, in in his letters, the letters that we have in the New Testament. So first I want to look at 1 Timothy, just to kind of get an idea of what this uh, relationship looks like. It's going to be 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, for this, take your Bible goggles off, all right? One thing that's really, really interesting about these letters is that uh, while at the same time you have these very, very practical applications for wider church life, they're also letters. They're personal letters that Paul wrote to Timothy. So, so understand Paul's tone. tone. Get, the, uh, get, this, get this picture of this relationship between Paul and Timothy. It's a really, really close one. It's really, really cool to see. 
So he wouldn't just give uh, Timothy advice about uh, this church that he had placed him in charge of and what to do about you know, false teachings and heresies and people who were getting out of hand. He would also give, them, give him these really like personal pieces of advice. He would say, Timothy, for example, had this uh, stomach problem that plagued him. And so Paul says, uh, you know, don't just drink water, take a little wine so your stomach doesn't get so upset. You know, so that you can work and so that you can do things. It's, it's, it's really interesting to see. So take your Bible goggles off and just read this as an older man speaking into the life of a younger man. These two very good friends. 1 Timothy chapter 4. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths and the faiths and the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things. Thanks, Paul. Holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a worthy saying that deserves full acceptance. This is why we labor and we strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. He says to Timothy, command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and impurity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given to you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Get this part. This is Paul's punchline. He says, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. What Paul's getting at here is that uh, what we can all take this message to heart. What Paul's getting at is that in order to minister to others, we need to be strong in our faith, Right? We need, to, we need to build ourselves up and grow in our knowledge of, uh, and, and in our relationship with Jesus Christ so that we can pass that knowledge on to others, so that we can pass that gospel, that truth, on to a new generation of Christians. Notice Paul's charge to Timothy. Uh, he, sa he says this later on in chapter 6. He says, fight the good fight of the faith. He's going he's gonna to carry that uh, analogy on in his next letter to Timothy. But for now, focus on that. Paul says, fight the good fight of the faith. If we are going to teach and mentor a new generation of Christians, we need to strive for it. It's going to take some work. It's going to take some personal work on ourselves. We need to build ourselves up to be strong in the gospel, to be strong in the things of faith, so that we can effectively pass our gospel to a new generation. The point is that the gospel was never given to us, and get this, the gospel was never given to the church for us to be passive consumers of it. The gospel of Jesus Christ was given to the church so that we could receive it and then go and make disciples. That's very important. Now Paul's going to continue this athletic metaphor in his next letter to Timothy. When Paul sends this, this is 2 Timothy, He's imprisoned under the emperor Nero. Nero was uh, famous for his persecution of Christians. Now Paul knows that he's nearing his death. And so he writes Timothy this next letter. Part of his, these motivations were, of course, to offer encouragement to the church and to Timothy, but it was also very personal. Remember, this isn't just pastor talking to new pastor. This is a friend speaking to a friend. Paul longed to see Timothy again. This young man whom Paul claimed worked with him as a son with his father. Timothy, of whom Paul could say, I have no one else like him. Get that picture. Get that image. Get that mentoring relationship. He would urge Timothy twice in this letter to come to him as soon as possible. So as I read this, again, take your Bible goggles off and notice the change in Paul's tone from the last letter. To me, this one seems a lot more urgent. It's as if he's giving this final bit of advice to Timothy before he moves on because he knows his death is coming. This is in uh, Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. You can follow along with me if you want. He says, You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, suffering, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. 
He's, he's going through everything. He says, you know everything about me. I've poured everything into you, all of my experiences. Everything that I know, you know it too. He says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. Get this. Because you, know from those, because you know those from whom you learned it. Head knowledge ain't enough. It's not enough for us to fill out our worksheets, to read our Bibles, to uh, hear a message every Sunday. Young Christians need to see the Christian life lived out in mature Christians. Otherwise, it won't stick. Otherwise, it has no meaning. This is particularly true among the postmodern generation because remember... When, when we shifted from rationalism and factualism to relativism, what also happens is that we become more focused on our experiences rather than the things we know. The postmodern is less interested in facts and knowledge and all these things and more interested in the experience. That's why it can take several years for someone to publicly confess their faith because they need to experience it. They need to walk some of the life. They need to do some of the things. They need to serve some of the people. So if they don't see... Christian life lived in a positive way in those older than them or in those who have done this Christian thing longer to them, then it's not going to make any sense. It's pointless. It's empty. I know for me, the reason I am here today, the reason that I am still active in the church as a 21-year-old, there are not many of us, by the way. The reason I'm here is because I grew up seeing Christianity, seeing faith lived out in the lives of people who are older than me. And I said, yeah, I want that. That makes sense to me. If I had just filled my head up with factual knowledge, I can't tell you how many people I know who grew up in the same schools that I did, learning the same things that I did, understanding apologetics and understanding all of the rational proofs for God, and yet still fall away because they didn't see faith lived in the lives of people older than them. We need it. We need to see it. We don't just need that. We also need the head knowledge, which is what Paul's about to get at here. He says, from infancy, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We need both of those things, not just the head knowledge. We need to see it lived out in the lives of mature Christians so that we can be prepared for what? Every good work. It says, in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. It's Paul saying to Timothy, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Does that sound familiar? It sounds familiar to me. Again, one of the consequences of this deeply interconnected world, the internet, all this stuff. One of the results of this is that the marketplace of ideas has grown exponentially. And this is what people do. They surround themselves with teachers who say what their itching ears want to hear. And if we do not teach young Christians the things of the gospel, the truths of the gospel, they're just going to get blown about by every new wind of doctrine. In order to keep new Christians' feet firmly planted in the gospel, firmly planted in the truth, we need to teach them, we need to mentor them, we need to encourage them, just like Paul did to Timothy. He says to Timothy, you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. It took Paul a couple of letters, and I'm sure a whole lot of time, to make sure that Timothy received that charge to make sure that Timothy had the confidence and the strength to walk that charge, to own it, and to say, yes, I can do this. 
yes, I can lead, yes, I can do the work of an evangelist. I think that takes time. I think a charge like that, I think that takes time to believe. That takes a lot of mentoring, that takes a lot of training, that takes a lot of teaching and equipping. Now Paul says his, says his famous words here. He says, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He says, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. So he finishes with that athletic, that athletic language again. Do we have any runners here? Anybody? I'll raise my hand to show you that it's okay to raise your hand. I don't run. But <laughs> any runners? Anybody run track, track and field in high school, something like that? All right, cool. All right. You guys ever run a, real, a relay race? A lot of times it's the most, uh, at a lot of these track and field events, sometimes they'll put the, the 4 by 400 uh, meter relay race at the very end because it's a very exciting event. It's really, really cool. And you have to, there's, there's a little bit of, a lot of it is just kind of running and making sure you pass the baton, but there's also a bit of strategy to it. You've got to put... Uh, on, on the Wikipedia page that I briefly looked at before I started this, <laughs> apparently you put, you have, to, you have to kind of stagger your runners. So you put like the second fastest at the beginning, you put the third fastest at the second, you put your slowest at, at, at the third leg, and then you put your fastest guy at the end, right? So it's just kind of interesting to me. And then uh, in between each, each runner, as they're handing off the baton, there's this big triangle or something, and you have to get the baton to the next guy within the triangle, okay? So... Imagine, imagine you're, you're a runner. Imagine I'm a runner. <laughs> and, and you've trained your entire life for this one race. And you've worked and worked and worked and worked. You've, you've, you've attended all of the co coaches' meetings every Sunday. You've learned as much as you can. You've trained yourself every day of your life as hard as you can. And you become one of the best runners on planet Earth. One of the best guys. And you start out for this relay race. And you're ready to go. You're ready to do this. You're one of the best runners in the world because you've trained your entire life to do it. What happens if you run and you break a world record? It's the fastest 400-meter dash that anyone's ever done. And what happens if you get to the end of your 400-meter dash, the fastest that's ever been run in this relay race? You just take your baton, sit down. The race doesn't get won, does it? The race isn't finished. Even worse, what if this happens? Notice the pained looks on the runners' faces. Those expressions of failure. Their team wasn't going to win. They knew it was over. They knew when they dropped the baton, it was done. And it didn't matter how fast they just ran their dash, right? It doesn't matter how fast they just ran their 400 meters. It's all worthless because they dropped the baton at the end. They didn't pass it to the next guy. So Paul finished his race. But what made Paul great is not just because he finished his race so well. It's because he knew that he was passing the gospel to a new generation, to a person who he knew was going to run just as well as he did. That's what made Paul great. Because Paul had thoroughly equipped Timothy for every good work. And not just Timothy, many others. Timothy, Titus, Silas, Barnabas, uh, John Mark, Luke. All kinds of people. Paul had equipped all of these people. He knew that he was passing the gospel on to a new generation of people who were going to spread it to the ends of the earth. So he didn't fear death. He knew that the work was going to carry on. So church, let's not drop the baton at the end of it. Let's thoroughly equip the next generation for every good work. It can't be done by one pastor. It can't be done by a group of elders and leaders. It takes every mature Christian growing and learning and becoming assured and convinced of the faith and then passing that knowledge on to a new generation of believers. We were not called to be passive consumers of the gospel. We were called to go and make disciples. You got it? All right, God bless you. Have a great weekend.